such that one, well, the center points all happen to live inside this T. So, so automatically from these other conditions, there's a submanifold that contains these things. In some sense, we, we kind of know that from this already if I'm not very precise about how nice of a submanifold this is, right? This is the Reifenberg condition. We kind of got that before. What's that? K-dimensional, absolutely. Two. T is, and this will answer that question too, one plus some constant here, it depends on the non-collapsing delta by Lipschitz now. So no longer by Holder, but by Lipschitz uh, to a ball in RK. So this says it's not just a Reifenberg submanifold. It has at least a bi structure to it. And three, that the, the measure of our neck region is less than some, again, constant depending on the non-collapsing times delta. So, so exactly what the stupid example kind of illustrates uh, actually has to be true in general. Uh, let, let me sort of make a point too. Uh, it's written up there, so I'll just point it out. Note, you should take this as an exercise, right? right? Um, as a, so, so those first three are exactly what, well, what I just wrote. Um, oh, there's no tin there. Sorry, um, I changed the definition of neck region this morning, so there's no tin, um, just BR. Uh, so, so in particular, if we look at these center, center points in the radii, then we have the following, following sort of packing estimate on them. That, that is, the k-dimensional Hausdorff measure uh, of the set of points with zero radii uh, is bounded, and so is the sum of r sub x to the k. So that's sort of to say, if you were treating this like, like a, uh, uh, a, uh, a Hausdorff content, right? The Hausdorff content of this, the, the set of balls is bounded. Uh, why is that automatic from the other condition? So, so that this is an exercise that's useful because in essence, when you're trying to prove either packing estimates or, or, or bounds on things, it's always like this. So, so you have your submanifold T, which is by Lipschitz to a ball of radius one in, in RK. Imagine the set of center points C naught. So, so what does it satisfy, right? It satisfies that if we look at the balls of radius R sub X, let's just say they're just joint. Maybe you drop by a, you know, the, the tau squared, but whatever, they're just joints. So if this was a collection of balls in the ball of radius one in RK, then that condition is automatic by a volume estimate, right? So that this is your exercise, all right? So a volume estimate would say that would have to be true. Now, this isn't an RK. They're sort of scattered around all over the place. But now that we have our bi Lipschitz map, we get to turn that covering into a covering of the ball of radius one in RK and then apply the result, right? So, so it's a nice exercise. How are we doing? 35, not great. I'll say this in words. Um, so, so if you look in the notes, this is all, everything I'm, basically everything I'm saying in my lecture actually in words is in the notes. Um, right now, I mean, they're just notes and half of it has com come from the fact that I was expecting to say something here and I figured I'd jot it down and then I'll clean it up later. All right, so, so most of what I'll say is there if you kind of half get what I'm saying and want to check it. Um, so so uh, a neat point here is that, that instead of looking at that sum there, you can associate to this region a measure all right, 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 so you can so-called packing measure. This is a very useful construction. So the k-dimensional Hausdorff measure on C naught plus, plus the sums of Rx to the k in C plus times the Dirac deltas at x. This is the so-called packing measure. In the same way that this sort of uh, uh, 
see here is sort of discreetly approximating uh, a submanifold. That's discreetly approximating the k-dimensional Hausdorff measure on that submanifold. And one can prove from all this that that's actually an Alforce regular uh, measure. And this, this is a useful point in applications. Yeah. Upper and lower. Upper and lower. That's right. Okay, great. And actually, it also follows from this. There's a packing estimate on this T, but I'll skip this. Okay, wonderful. Okay, we have uh, done two of three painful things today. Um, we, we've introduced neck regions, which is somehow the worst. Uh, we, we, we've said that, so think that picture there, which is not so bad anyway. We've said that if you happen to have a neck region by some miracle, you're handing them a random measure, and it just so happens some ball has a neck region structure on it, then, then it's pretty well behaved. That, that, that you can at least break it into these two pieces, the, the, the neck piece itself, which has a, a volume bound, and a submanifold, which has a bi Lipschitz control. Right. So, so now the last question that's sort of remaining, if you have any hope of using this to prove a more general theorem is, do these things exist? Because if these things don't exist, and I mean often, then so what? Um, so, so what we're going to do next is talk about the, the, the neck decomposition. And I'm going to do that straight up here because it's, it's long. Um, so, so for all of these things, it's the type of thing where, where if you write down the definition, you think about some basic examples, and you ask yourself, what are all the properties of these examples? And, and you list them, and you start asking, which ones exist in general? Then all the ones that answer yes are what are appearing here, right? I mean, that, that's basically what happens if you give yourself about three hours of thinking. So here's the setup. Um, we have a measure. Uh, I'm going to assume here uh, that there is a point-wise bound on the sum of the Betty numbers, uh, this, this, this Dini sum, but actually we can do better, and you have to if you, if you actually want to do more useful examples. The, actually, the examples I'll show you, I'm going to show you examples of this decomposition as well, and the examples won't all satisfy that, because that rules out most interesting things. Um, you, you can replace this with the Carlson estimate, so you can instead assume the following. So, so for every ball of radius r, inside the ball of radius one, you can assume an integral estimate holds instead, but it's gotta be for every ball now. So instead of assuming a pointwise bound, you can assume this integral bound holds in every ball. That may mean nothing to you. What's the difference? Um, uh, in the examples, you'll see the difference. I mean, the interesting examples actually satisfy this, but, but, but not that. But I'll just mention it for now. So we have a measure. We have control over Betty numbers. Assume pointwise, whatever. Then uh, fix some constants in your background. F fix, fix a non-collapsing constant V. Fix a, a, a sort of a Reifenberg constant delta. Then, then as long as delta is sufficiently small, the claim is that your original ball of radius one, which is where your measure lives, can be covered in this nasty way. And what it's being covered by is the following. So three pieces, um, S minus, SK, and S plus, right? So, so in the spirit of all the examples I've been giving, right, right, this is supposed to be the SK is gonna be like where it's behaving k-dimensionally, the S plus is gonna be like where it's behaving bigger than k-dimensionally, and the S minus is gonna be like where it's behaving less than k-dimensionally, right, right? So th this, this is how you wanna think. And S plus will, will, will involve two sorts of pieces. It'll involve a whole bunch of neck regions, and a whole bunch of other balls, which I'll tell you exactly what they, they're actually easier than neck regions in some sense. And SK, now the k-dimensional piece, is only, right, right, so, so we got from the neck structure theorem, right, that whenever you have a neck, you had that the C naught part of it is k-rectifiable. So our k-dimensional piece is only the union uh, of the, the, the k-rectifiable pieces that come from the neck regions. That's it, there's nothing else in our rectifiable piece. Right, so it's actually quite simple from this point of view. and the conditions that hold the following. So as the name N would suggest, N is a neck region. It's a K delta V neck region. And in particular, the measure of 
that this neck region in sub A is bounded by delta times R sub A to the K. So again, that's the scale invariant thing. Take that ball, we scale it to the ball of radius one, get a bound, rescale it back down, what do you get? You get that. And the C knots are all K rectifiable. Theorem seven obviously means the next structure theorem. I copied and pasted this from the notes. These B balls, the other part of the S plus, well, they're very simple. They just have measure bounds, right? right? So each one of these balls, the, the, the mass uh, of our measure mu isn't very big. It's at most of the, 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 this, this V we picked, which could be very small if you want. It doesn't matter, small as you want, in fact. So note, both pieces in S plus have measure bounds, right? The neck regions have measure bounds. The, the, the balls of radius RB have measure bounds. They all have measure bounds. And what's, what's, now, what's the important part? This would be totally useless in practice if there were too many of these balls now. So first we have to, on the one hand, we have to know there's, there, there's at least some of these balls for this decomposition to be useful. On the other hand, we don't want there to be too many of these balls because if there's too many of these balls, we're not really proving a mass bound on anything, right? Because it sums up too much. So, so the second condition actually is that we have the, the, the content estimates that says we don't have too many of these balls. If you think for a minute about what this means, in fact, let's just do it, because it's actually a nice thing. I think you just want to feel for what's happening. So remember in our rectifiable theorem, we're trying to decompose into a mu plus, plus a mu k, and this is supposed to have bounded measure. But let's just define this to be mu on the set S plus, right? then, you know, in this context anyway, why are we done? Why do we have a measure bound? It's just the combination of one, two, and three, right? So the, the mass of mu plus on the entire ball is what? It's less than or equal to the, the, the sums of the masses of the neck regions plus the sums of the masses of our volume bounded balls, plus, is there anything else? There's nothing else. And what's this bounded by? These are both bounded by, well, some constant, whether it's V or, or, or delta, so I'll just say C of N delta V, times the sum of R A to the K, plus the sum of R B to the K, and now that's bounded. So we get our we get our total volume bound for that set in like four lines. Uh, let me point out for, for you PDE people out there. So, so you know, if you're talking about nonlinear harmonic map or Einstein manifold, um, the, the, or say, say for instance for, for, for L2 bounds for Einstein manifolds, the, the, the first way these sort of effective estimates were proved is exactly like this. You do exactly this decomposition. You prove that on each of these neck regions and these balls, you have a scale invariant bound on whatever you're trying to control, the energy of your function or the, 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 the L2 norm or the curvature or whatever you're trying to do, and you prove there aren't too many balls and just sum the things up, right? It looks exactly like this, like verbatim. Uh, the, the proof of the bounds is quite different, but, but once you're at this point, it's verbatim. Is the last one probably the way I'm writing it? Yeah, gamma. So keep in mind, right, as I said at the beginning, let gamma be one, so rescale. Gamma can be one, we scale it back, right? That, that's actually how I'm gonna do it. I, probably one could keep track of it and keep the gamma there, but that is too much effort. So, so I just do a rescaling. Absolutely. So that's conditions one, two, and three. This is basically what controls S plus. Um, I think this also controls SK. Is there something left? Ah, yeah, one more piece, right? Sorry, I meant to have a break there.
and notice to finish the, the rectifiable Reifenberg. So what did you have to do? We had to take our mu, split into two pieces, and it's supposed to satisfy two conditions. This guy was supposed to have the mass bound, which we just proved. This guy was supposed to be K-rectifiable, with, let's just say, K-dimensional Hausdorff measure bounds, but even more. And that follows immediately as well, because, well, if we just look at the decomposition, what's left? What's left is to restrict mu to, to the SK and the S-minus pieces. So we can define mu K, by definition, as just being mu restricted to, to SK mu and S-minus. And what do we have? Well, S minus has k-dimensional Hausdorff measure zero. So this has, I mean, this doesn't control Hausdorff measure bounds at all, and it doesn't, if we're looking at the support of this set. So the support is this and this, right? And that's all we're trying to control about this guy. Um, and it doesn't stop being rectifiable. On the other hand, SK is now just some countable union of k-rectifiable things, and therefore it's k-rectifiable. All that's left is to get the Hausdorff measure bound, and it's exactly the same as this, which is that if we want HK of the support, of mu k. Then we end up getting our following bound here. It's just, well, we don't have to worry about the s minus piece. We do if we want the packing estimates, but let's ignore that. So it's the sum over a over h k of c naught a. And recall what our bounds on this for. Did I actually write it on this? Chart, I did not. So recall from, from the next structure theorem, this was uniformly bounded, which means uniformly bounded by Ra to the k. And again, by condition three, this is bounded. And then that gives us our decomposition. So th th this is simply where the, I mean, th this is much more general than the, the rectifiable Reifenberg. Basically, the rectifiable Reifenberg I wrote down so I could give an understandable version. I mean, actually, in most applications, this is what you care about. But, but you know, it takes a while to absorb this one. The other one's a little bit easier to kind of wade into. I think we made the mistake in that paper with Nick Edelin and Daniel Veltorcha of sort of stating it more like this originally. And who the heck's going to get anything from that? OK. So I'm going to keep this up, because in my last couple of minutes, I just want to give two examples uh, of neck decompositions so we can see how this works in, in uh, a not completely trivial situation. I'll raise this. Okay, so let, let, let's do two, two examples. No, I mean, easy ones, reasonably speaking. So, so let, let's take a, let's just look at R2, why not? And let's look at the following. So here's our ball of radius one. And let me look at two lines inside here. So let me look at, Here's some L, and here's some L prime. And for simplicity's sake, I'm going to sort of mimic that example over there. I'm not going to let there be any other fluff floating around, but you can easily add the other fluff exactly the way we always do. Um, we're going to let mu just be V times the Hausdorff measure on these, these two guys. So, so. Right, so so the, the, the mass of a ball is simply what? Uh, I'm going to take a set, restrict it to these two lines, and, and simply integrate what their one-dimensional measure is on these lines. Right? That, that, that's what our measure is. Uh, now, case in point, by the way, uh, already, that, that this sort of Carlson estimate has to be used to apply this, not, not the point-wise bound. Why? Because what happens if I'm here, and I look at a ball of any radius, right? Then 
I mean, how close is, is the support of this guy to being contained inside a single affine plane? It's some definite distance away, whatever it is. It's the same definite distance away on every single ball. So if I go doing that integral at some point, which is like summing over every scale, I clearly get infinity at this point. Right, right? So if I only had the pointwise bounds, I couldn't even look at this example. Uh, but we can do this weaker estimate, which is certainly true. So basically, it blows up like log here. So it's definitely going to be in some L1, perfectly fine L1 sort of sense. And scale invariantly, it will be bounded in every ball. So now, what's our decomposition look like here? So actually, it's not so bad. So first off, what do the neck regions look like? Well, let's make the following observation. Let's take a ball of some radius here. Uh, note this ball here, the measure on this ball, looks exactly like that example over there. Right? I mean, you've now ignored everything else, so there's no other plane out here. Everything is exactly like this. This here has a neck region structure exactly like that. Let C just all be C naught. Right? Let it all be this piece here. Right, right? So, so R in one can be, here's R, sort of maybe in one, something like that. Now here, let's half the radius of that ball and do the same thing. Here's R in two. It's half the radius of that ball at our N3, and so forth and so on. We keep halving the size of the balls, so they keep missing all the other nonsense going on. And you do the exact same thing over here, and so forth and so on, over here and over here to get all your neck balls. So that's it. So your neck balls, in this case, are simply, basically it's a copy, right? Where you drop by, every time you go down a scale, you, you drop the size of the radius by a scale. And now you ask, I mean, why is the content bound on this actually hold? I mean, so what's the one-dimensional content of this? Like basically a half, a fourth, an eighth, a sixteenth, so forth and so on. Right? So the one-dimensional content is summable and you get a, a bound. So there's not a finite number of balls, but you get a bound on the one-dimensional content on the number of balls for the neck regions. And for the, 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 the B balls with, with bounded mass, it's exactly the same thing. I just do it over here instead. So over here, I can call this uh, an R sub B and an X sub B. Right? So the mass on this ball is zero. Well, that certainly satisfies our condition. It would still satisfy our condition if we added some, some, some two-dimensional Hausdorff measure piece over here, for that matter. And you play the exact same game. Half, 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 half. Do it some more over here so you can fill it in. Right? That's it, right? So, so it's, it's... So th th this is somehow what the, 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 the easiest non-trivial example kind of looks like in this context. So, so if I wanted to just be annoying, uh, I could have easily added a delta plus an H2 here plus a huge number, maybe alpha naught, as big as I want, times a direct delta at the origin, for instance, and that this would still be a, a decomposition for this measure, which would still satisfy the same conditions. Where's the origin go in this decomposition? Uh, it could be C naught. Exactly, that's a great point. Uh, so, so what he's saying is I missed a point, and the, the, the way I sh sh should actually get this point in all this is I, I should have a uh, kind of a C naught here, which is a single point here. So, so note what we've basically done is take a measure, which doesn't look, two dimen which doesn't look one dimensional, but we know it kind of looks one dimensional in all these pieces, and we'll be able to bound it by, by, by regions where it looks one dimensional, so we get to treat it like it's one dimensional, um, and the number of such pieces is one dimensionally bounded. Right, right? That, that, that's, that's, that, that's really what all this says in words. Example. One more example. And then you're free to leave and regret having come. By the way, tomorrow's lecture won't be this bad. 
Um, it, it'll be technical, but it, it'll be kind of a, it won't be a new technical, right? You won't have to absorb a new idea in the process. So, so, so it won't be quite so mysterious looking. So let me do something similar here, but let, let my L and L prime be parallel this time. Stop that. Okay. Jeez. All right. L prime and L. And I'm going to play the same game. I'm going to let mu just be the sum of those two. I've got two minutes, so I'm just going to say, here's our mu. So, so what, what should, the, and let's let the distance here between these two guys be some r, and say r is super, super, super small, right? I'm drawing it as being not so small, but let's say it's super, super, super small, right? So, so how should one actually do the decomposition in this case? Then the way you should do it is that, you know, if r is really, really small, and you're on the ball of radius one, and you're staring at this example, this l and this l prime, they look the same. You can't tell the difference between them. It looks like a single affine sort of line that everything is stuck nearby, not two of them, right? You can't see the two at this point. So what you're gonna do is call your neck region to basically, you know, your, your, your first neck region will basically just cover both of these guys, and here will be our, our first neck region, right? Everything away from this. Everything away from the, the, these guys here. There's too many lines floating around here. Let me draw it like a tubular neighborhood instead of a union of balls so it's not so ugly. And then I'm saying, okay, so I throw that out. So our first neck region is everything away from that, right? So you just keep going down, going down, going down until you suddenly get close enough that you notice, hey, wait a minute, this wasn't two lines, this wasn't one line, it's two lines. And then what you're gonna do is treat each of these guys, that's the neck region just like over there, cover it and do the exact same thing for this neck region. Fill in the rest with some balls that are bounded, right? And now these are your last neck regions that all appear. So, so in this example, this is what it looks like. It's one neck region, which becomes sort of two unions of neck regions as you get down. Okay, I'm done, thank you.